I may have the hardest job of the evening. I just am following probably the most, one of the most inspiring speakers I've ever heard. And then one of the most um, energetic speakers I've ever heard. Um, but thank you, too, for that introduction. By the way, I had one of those Rock'em Sock'em robots, and I think it didn't have batteries. But um, I also want to congratulate my fellow honoree tonight, Aida Zaibo, who you'll hear from shortly. And Haven, um, I just want to say that all of us were moved by your comments tonight, and uh, it's something we'll always all remember. I certainly know I will. I want to thank the Ad Club for this honor. Arnold Rosoff left a splendid legacy. If I may quote the great musical Hamilton, what is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you'll never see. When I think of Arnold Rosoff, I imagine a beautiful garden of smart and talented and funny and driven young Rosoff scholarship recipients who have helped so many companies here thrive. That garden grew thanks to Arnold Rosoff's leadership, foresight, and perhaps most important, empathy. Back when Arnold Rosoff first championed this award, he put himself in the shoes of young men and women who looked nothing like him, who came from backgrounds nothing like his, and from families nothing like his. He knew two things. In America, everyone deserves a shot. And in the corporate world, no one thrives unless everyone has a voice. Today, we call that cultural competency. Back then, I imagine Arnold Rosoff might have just called it good business. I was lucky enough to be raised by a man who was also a good businessman, a man with a deep commitment to fairness, to equity, and social justice. My father, not your father, true, but... <laughs> My father was the co-owner of a property and casualty insurance agency in Boston, exactly right around the corner from where we are tonight. And he saw no distinction between his business goals and his advocacy for social and racial equality. He was one of the few, if not the only, white insurance agents in Boston to offer policies to minority-owned businesses in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. All his life, he adopted and befriended strangers and fledgling organizations, especially those fighting for civil rights. My father served as the president of the Boston chapter of the Urban League and often recalled the experience of driving to a conference in upstate New York with some fellow Urban League leaders. As African Americans, they were in constant fear that they wouldn't be able to find hotels that would accept them. My father pledged that he would do whatever he could to see that they were welcome anywhere he was. That was a commitment he stayed true to in one way or another for the rest of his life. I've always tried to honor my father's values, his legacy, in my own work, which I've dedicated to high quality, affordable health care for all, one of the great social justice battles of our time. I'm proud that. <laughs> I'm proud that Blue Cross has been at the forefront of that battle. Working with others, we helped make Massachusetts the first state and still the only state with near universal health coverage, the first state where health coverage is considered a right, not a privilege. We continue those fights today. We're committed to expanding access to good hospitals, good physicians, even good food and fitness opportunities, what we call wellness. The opportunities for wellness, we know, can vary by zip code. That's a different kind of legacy than the one Alexander Hamilton sings about, a crueler legacy left over from the era of redlining that my father fought so hard against. Sometimes those battles for health care are waged in Congress or on Beacon Hill, and they get big headlines. And sometimes they take place in playgrounds and kitchens with no fanfare at all. One step my company has taken is a program we call Dot RX in partnership with the Codman Square Health Center in Dorchester. It's a program that's designed to give families access to healthy food, 
outdoors activities and fitness. We connect patients with health coaches and some wonderful partners, the Daily Table, the Dorchester Y, HealthWorks Community Fitness, and the Appalachian Mountain Club. Kids and their parents get outside, they exercise, they go to cooking classes, they learn to eat better, and they get fresher air. It's a small step, an experiment, but that doesn't make it any less important. These are opportunities that can be harder to find in Codman Square than they are a few miles away in a different zip code. We want to make it a little easier. But when I became CEO of Blue Cross, I just didn't want to try to create change in the world around us. I wanted to take a good hard look at what was happening behind our own doors. We serve a diverse community. Does our company look like the community we serve? Are we listening to our community? Are we hearing our community? I'll be candid. Eight years ago, it was clear to me we had a lot of work to do. It's easy to talk about how wonderful diversity and inclusion are. It's harder to follow through, to hold leaders accountable for their hiring and promotion practices, to change a culture, to infuse inclusion into everything we do, but it's worth it. It starts with the hiring process. We look for diverse candidates for every open position, but it goes so well beyond hiring. We include diversity and inclusion goals in our senior leaders' performance plans. So when I evaluate my top executives, I'm grading their performance on diversity and inclusion, just as I do sales, finance, and other metrics. As my colleagues from Blue Cross who have joined me here tonight know, we're constantly striving to be a more inclusive organization from our grassroots on up. More than 1,000 of our employees participate in our employee resource groups. They're making a difference both inside and outside our company. Earlier this month, our Alzul Al Lat Latinx Employee Resource Group won the Thurgood Marshall Award from the Boston Bar Association. That award was for their pro bono work with our law department aiding undocumented children in Boston who are at risk of deportation. Some of our employees serve as translators for those children so our lawyers can help protect their rights in court. And then there's our board and management team. Today, our board chair is a woman, our vice chair is a woman, the chair of our audit committee is a woman, the chair of our governance committee is a woman, and half our board and senior leadership team are women or people of color. A diverse board and leadership team set an example for the rest of our company, and our diversity is one of our best competitive advantages. A few months ago, a Harvard Business Review study of 1,700 companies across eight countries found diversity and inclusion correlate strongly with innovation and profitability. That's no surprise to us at Blue Cross. Our commitment to diversity and inclusion has made us a better place to work and improved our ability to serve our members and our wider community. That's because a company with a diversity of thought and backgrounds, a company as diverse as this room is right now, is a smarter, more agile company. It can spot new opportunities. It can think boldly and act nimbly. A diverse, inclusive company can also hear criticism, and it can respond with empathy. If I may, I'd like to talk about empathy for a moment. We live in a time short on empathy, not necessarily short on compassion or sympathy, which are easier, simpler emotions, but short on empathy, which is harder and more complex. It sometimes seems if we're losing the knack of imagining what it's like to be in another person's shoes, let alone see the world through their eyes. When we lose that knack, we also lose our appreciation for diversity, diversity of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, even diversity of thought and experience. Now, there's a nascent field of science studying the physiology of empathy. It turns out that neuroscientists can actually see empathy. There are pathways in the prefrontal cortex that light up when a person is observing someone else's pain or pleasure, even someone who is very different. Now, I'm not a scientist. I have no idea what pathways of neurons 
They're called mirror neurons, they're called. I don't know what they look like, but I know when people are responding to another's grief or joy, something happens. I like to think about that pathway, the empathy pathway that runs beneath our skin. I imagine it's tangled, delicate, humming with life. I imagine perhaps it looks like a system of roots that runs beneath the earth, roots rich in nutrients, the kind of roots that run under a lush and splendid garden. This award is called the Champion of Change Award. It's an honor and a tall order. If I can champion anything tonight, I would like to champion those roots. And I'd like to call on all of you in this room, all leaders of our community, my fellow champions of change, to keep planting that garden. Thank you very much.